Here's an example of one of the questions, Dr. Bercelli. If I have a person that has no ear and the other is working good, will this prevent them from passing a DOT physical? No. Yeah. As long as they meet the standard in the one ear. Yeah. But that's that's the type of questions we'll be getting for the most part. Okay. So it's what employers need to know about DOT or about DOT physicals? DOT in general? Well, you could say about the DOT, I guess. But you could, you could focus it to DOT physicals. I mean, that's primarily. The content. Yeah. Okay, Allison, I just sent the reminder to the speakers. Um, okay. Thank you. You've got one minute. <clears throat> we can see your mouse moving, Allison, just in case you wanted to know that. Oh, but you can't see the control panel, right? Just the mouse, right? Just the mouse. Okay, so I just I won't, yeah. So I won't be touching that <clears throat> then when we get going. Thanks for letting me know. Okay, I think we should go ahead and get started. Um, we're at two thirty-one. Okay. Okay. So let's see here. So.
star one. Uh, okay. Not working for me. Anna, do you mind starting it? Yeah. Good afternoon. This is Melissa Hay. I'm a director of product development with Concentra, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar regarding what employers need to know about the DOT. I have just a couple of housekeeping items before we get into the content. One is just to remind you that all of lines are muted, but we do encourage you to submit questions using the question feature in the webinar. Um, if you aren't seeing a question feature, please go ahead and send questions in using the chat feature. We have a moderator who's going to be monitoring the questions and we will cover those questions at the end of the presentation. One other thing I'd like to share with you is that this is being recorded and within a day or two from our uh, session completing, we will be sending the link and the recording out to you by email. So please keep an eye out for that. So to begin, I'd like to welcome our guest and speaker today is Dr. Anne-Marie Pricelli. Dr. Pacelli has her MD and JD from the St. Louis University. She's board certified in internal medicine, and she joined Concentra in 1991 and now is a chair for Concentra's Transportation Medical Expert Panel. She's also our clinical director of on-site strategic accounts and definitely has a special and deep interest in all things DOT. Dr. Pacelli, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. And welcome, everybody. Want to go to the next slide? So today we're going to uh, talk about um, the Department of Transportation. I'm going to give an overview. We're going to go through a trucking industry snapshot, um, go over and through the DOT physical exam, a brief um, discussion on drug testing, and then to the treatment of musculoskeletal injuries, um, and DOT disqualified medical conditions. So first is the Department of Transportation overview. Let's go to the next slide, thanks. The Department of Transportation of the DOT regulates interstate commerce. So the definition of that is trade, traffic, and or transportation involving the crossing of a state boundary and the vehicle and or its contents must cross or there must be intent to cross the state boundary. So basically, um, even if the driver is staying within the state, if the contents have um, come from out of state, that driver is engaged in interstate commerce. So we're gonna focus on the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, or FMCSA, during this talk. So why does the FMCSA require medical certification, verifying that drivers are medically fit uh, for duty? In 1999, a driver crashed a big motor coach in New Orleans. It was called the Mother's Day uh, bus accident. The accident was uh, part of a systemic failure of the medical certification process to detect and remove medically unqualified drivers from service. About 22 individuals were killed and many were seriously injured. The NTSB noted that the driver should not have been medically qualified. He was actually very sick at the time he was driving. And they noted that this was not an isolated case. This was part of a systemic failure on the part of the certification process. At that point, the National Registry of Certified Medical Examiners was created, and now only certified medical examiners listed on the registry may perform um, FMCSA exams. In this presentation, we'll be focusing on com commercial motor vehicles. So even though we refer to DOT physicals, we're really talking about FMCSA regulations for commercial commercial motor vehicle drivers. Next slide. So a trucking industry uh, snapshot. The trucking industry represents $738 billion in annual revenue, and there are roughly 3.5 million commercial drivers on the road. It's expected that um, 890,000 new drivers will be needed over the next 10 years, and that freight load will increase by 3 billion tons in the next 10 years. From 1980 to 2017, fatal crashes involving large trucks actually declined 
But unfortunately, we're seeing a trend in the wrong direction over the last 10 years. Fatalities have increased 9% over 2016 and 41% since 2009. On average, that's equivalent to 13 people killed and 400 injured each day. Next slide. Okay. The trucking industry ranks among the industries having the highest occupational illness and injury rates in the U.S. And workers' compensation costs to motor carriers are tremendous. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics data from 2017, the non-fatal occupational injury incident rates for truck transportation nationally was 4.2 injuries per 100 workers as compared to 2.8 injuries per 100 workers for private industry. The BLS reported in 2018 that workers in truck transportation experienced work work-related musculoskeletal disorders at a rate of 62 per 10,000 workers as compared to 28 per 10,000 workers for private industry. So over the next several minutes, we'll look at useful approaches to support transportation safety, as well as ex examine what, we, what can disqualify a driver. So the DOT physical exam. In 2019, Concentra will perform nearly 1 million DOT physical exams. We're the leading medical provider for DOT exams and driver certification. We have more than 1,200 certified medical examiners listed on the National Registry. Um, and Concentra in 2017 had implemented an electronic uh, DOT physical. And in 2019, we implemented electronic pre-placement physical. Um, employers experience numerous benefits from electronic DOT exams. The entire physical exam process, from authorization and clinic intake procedures to physical exam and results reporting, is conducted in an electronic paperless environment. The benefits of that include um, better and easier administration of the physical exams, Greater assurance that physical exam documentation is free of errors, and that's a big one. Faster results, and the ability to access reports more easily in our uh, Concentris employer portal. So DOT physicals must be performed by a medical examiner listed on the NRCME, or National Registry of Certified Medical Examiners. Um, this uh, slide shows a screenshot of the physical exam portion of the medical examination report form, or long form. So the components um, include general appearance. The medical examiner makes a note of a variety of factors, including obesity, are there any limps, tremors, or other conditions that might indicate an illness or other concern. Um, eyes, eye charts are used to assess visual acuity. We use a Snellen chart. So a driver who normally wears corrective lenses may wear them during the exam. Um, contact lens wearers should carry an extra set of glasses with them when they drive. The driver needs to meet the 2040 or better vision in each eye and both eyes together. Um, regarding the ears, the medical examiner notes any evidence of ear disease or disorders that can uh, impact balance, such as Meniere's disease or vertigo. Two tests of hearing may be used. Um, failing the first, a forced whisper is what we typically start with, means the medical examiner may administer an audiometric test. And we can reverse the order of the two tests, but the driver must pass one of the tests to be certified. And the driver only needs to meet the standard in one ear. So it's um, one eye, or one ear, two, <laughs> one ear, two eyes certified, is the phrase we use. Um, throat, the medical examiner looks for any deformities likely to interfere with breathing or swallowing. Often we document what's called a malampati score, which is a predictor of sleep apnea. Basically, we score how much of the structures in the back of the throat are visible. The less visible the structures, the higher the score. So we can go up to four, and a score of three or four is associated with sleep apnea. Um, heart, the medical examiner inspects for any current irregularities in heart function or evidence of an enlarged heart, congestive heart failure, or other cardiovascular disease. Um, if the medical examiner determines an EKG or electrocardiogram is indicated, one may be performed. Guarding blood pressure, so less than 140 over 90 is the goal. Um, if the driver has hypertension or is being medicated for hypertension, 
recertification should occur more frequently than the standard once every 24 months. Typically, it's um, annually. Um, the driver with stage one hypertension, so that's a driver typically that um, their blood pressure isn't is less than 150, 160 over 100, um, or they're not on medication, uh, or, and they're not on medication, that driver can be certified for up to a year. Um, a driver with stage two hypertension um, should only receive a three-month certification. And then a driver with a blood pressure of 180 over 110 or greater really requires immediate attention and shouldn't be certified. And when it does, the blood pressure does come down to 140 over 90, the driver can um, be certified, but should have six months intervals of certification. Um, the lungs, so we look for any abnormalities in chest wall expansion, respiratory rate, breath sound. We may require pulmonary function testing or chest x-ray. Um, the abdomen, we inspect for any weakness, tenderness, enlargement of the liver or spleen, or the presence of masses. For the genitourinary exam, um, a urinalysis required for assessment of protein, blood, and sugar. Um, elevated levels may indicate an underlying medical problem that needs to be addressed. Um, the medical examiner is also required to check for hernias. Uh, the spine musculoskeletal exam, medical examiner assesses for, um, you know, looking at any previous surgery that may have occurred, um, examine uh, the individual for deformities, limitation of motion, any tenderness, um, and we may require additional testing. Uh, extremities, this part of the exam looks for any loss or impairment in function of legs, feet, toes, arms hands or fingers, as well as any deformity, you know, loss of muscular, muscular tone. Um, neuro exam, the medical examiner assesses the function of the brain and nervous system. The focus is really on mental awareness, motor function and balance, sensory response and reflexes. Okay, next slide. I'm gonna talk a little bit about drug testing. So drug and alcohol screening may be done pre-employment, randomly, for cause or suspicion, post-accident, and upon re uh, to return for duty after a drug or alcohol violation. Um, DOT testing is five-panel drug test regimen. As of January 1st, 2018, um, the opi opiates category was renamed opioids because now um, the test includes the semi-synthetic opioids, which are uh, listed on the slide. Um, but the, we test for marijuana or THC, cocaine, amphetamines, opioids, and PCP. Only urine testing is permitted for regulated tests. Rapid tests and hair testing is not permitted for regulated testing. We will be hosting a drug and alcohol testing seminar in November, which will go into a lot more detail on this particular topic. Okay, treatment of musculoskeletal injuries. So long haul truck drivers are significantly affected by musculoskeletal injuries with the incident rates three and a half times higher than the national average. Two leading musculoskeletal injuries are injuries to the arm at 26% and back injuries at 21%. The two leading causes of musculoskeletal injuries to long haul drivers are falls at 38% and contact with an object or equipment at 33%. Um, we practice a sports medicine approach in the treatment of musculoskeletal injuries. Our goal is really to restore function. There's much less emphasis uh, on pain. It's important that the patient is an active participant in their treatment and as I mentioned, our focus is not on pain, but on function and what the injured worker can do, not what they can't do, a more positive approach. Okay, let's talk about DOT disqualifying medical conditions. Um, disqualifying medical conditions may take truckers off the road near term, but not always may be permanent, uh, permanent roadblock for the driver or the employer. Understanding the FMCSA standards and guidelines, the medical examiner's role, and when there's room for discretion in deciding whether to grant certification can keep your uh, trucking business running at full throttle, forgive the pun. Ultimately, the goal is really to identify conditions that may cause gradual or sudden incapacitation. 
In some instances, the driver can return to driving after, after the condition is treated. In other cases, the condition is progressive or cannot be treated to a point where returning to driving would be safe. So let's talk about DOT disqualifying medical conditions. And there are 13 FMCSA standards that the driver must meet. Four of them are non-discretionary. So the medical um, examiner really has no discretion in interpreting the standard. The standard is what it is. So one of the first ones, epilepsy, um, or any other condition that can result in loss of consciousness. In order to meet the standard, the driver must be seizure-free off meds for 10 years, off seizure meds. If they had a single seizure, they would have a five-year wait off uh, seizure meds. There is an epilepsy ex exemption that may be available to these drivers. Um, it's actually the criteria for that exemption is listed in one of the, um, uh, the seizure uh, MEP reports by the uh, FMCSA's medical expert panel. Um, vision or hearing loss. Drivers are unable to demonstrate at least 20-40 vision in each eye and both eyes together with or without corrective lenses are medically disqualified. For hearing, if the driver cannot pass the force whisper test, pass an, an audiometry test may still allow for certification, but failing both tests would be disqualifying. Drivers with monocular vision, so vision in one eye, now they would have to meet the standard in the other eye, and this isn't for drivers who um, you know, have uh, reversible uh, vision in one eye. It's truly for vision, you know, for drivers who have lost the vision permanently in one eye. They can be certified with a vision exemption. Um, drivers who do not meet the hearing standard may also be certified with a hearing exemption. Um, and both these federal exemptions are issued by the FMCSA. Drivers with the hearing exemption um, are not allowed, though, to drive um, in buses. Um, Diabetes. Uh, in 2018, a new diabetes rule was finalized, allowing drivers with well-controlled diabetes requiring insulin to obtain certification without an exemption. These drivers must have their treating clinician complete the form uh, MCSA 5870, which is called uh, the Insulin Treated Diabetes Mellitus Assessment Form, and it must be completed no more than 45 days prior to the certification exam. You can actually find that form online. Uh, the form should be brought in uh, when they are, are going to uh, you know, go for their DOT exam. They also must have recorded three months of electronic glucose log measurements. Um, and if they bring in uh, you know, those two items, they can be certified for up to one year. If they don't have the blood glucose log measurements, um, but you know, have the MC MCSA 5870, they can um, be certified for three months for them to get their blood glucose logs. Uh, Schedule one drugs include heroin, LSD, marijuana or cannabis, ecstasy, et cetera. Regarding the use of marijuana, even if a licensed medical practitioner has prescribed or recommended it, marijuana use is a disqualifying medical condition. Um, this is true whether it's used alone um, or CBD oil or any other product or preparation derived from hemp or cannabis. Now, CBD oil, in, in order to be legal from a federal perspective, must meet the requirements of the Farm Bill. And really, right now, there's only one product on the market that meets the requirements, and it's a pharmaceutical-grade CBD oil used to treat seizures, mainly in children. Um, methadone, while not specifically mentioned in the regulations, is mentioned as a disqualifying, uh, is disqualifying in the medical advisory criteria. Okay, let's talk about the discretionary disqualifying medical conditions. Now, these are conditions that fall under the nine discretionary standards. The medical examiner is able to use their discretion regarding certification. However, the medical examiner um, is expected to follow FMCSA guidance or medical expert panel recommendations and advisory criteria when certifying a driver. So let's first start with high blood pressure. There are no numbers listed in the standard. It reads, has no current clinical diagnosis of high blood pressure likely to interfere with his or her ability to operate a commercial motor vehicle safely. But medical providers are, um, I mean, medical examiners are provided guidelines 
and um, but they must use discretion in deciding whether to grant certification. So typically, we are going to follow the the um, the guidelines given to us by the FMCSA, and they uh, actually base those that guidance on old blood pressure criteria. Um, there's newer, you know, criteria that actually lowers the uh, stage one blood pressure, but the FMCSA has not adopted those more recent guidelines. Um, respiratory condition: the medical examiner may seek further tests or send a driver to a pulmonary specialist to determine if the condition should be disqualifying. Uh, the most common condition that falls under this standard uh, is sleep apnea. Uh, obstructive sleep apnea falls, it's, as I said, under the respiratory uh, regulations. And that reads, has no established medical history or clinical diagnosis of a respiratory dysfunction likely to interfere with his ability to control um, and drive a commercial motor vehicle safely. Um, the regulation is discretionary. The medical examiner uses the FMCSA guidance advisory criteria to decide if the driver meets the standard um, outlined in the regulation. Unlike vision and hearing, which are non-discretionary, the driver must meet exactly what is outlined in the, in the regulation for those non-discretionary standards. None of the discretionary regulations go into any detail regarding specific medical conditions. And so sometimes it's not clear why we refer drivers for sleep studies while there is no mention of um, sleep studies or OSA in the regulation, it's our job as medical examiners to correctly interpret and follow the FMCSA um, guidance and recommendations. In 2015, the FMCSA sent a bulletin to all medical examiners reminding them that they cannot ex ignore sleep apnea. Um, with other sleep disorders, um, or including sleep apnea, and why, when we might disqualify a driver, um, typically, we're going to give them 90 days to get a sleep study unless we determine they're high risk. They've fallen asleep at the wheel or something like that. Um, a sleep study diagnostic for, uh, so we might, we would disqualify them if they had a sleep study diagnostic for uh, obstructive sleep apnea that their sleep specialist has re recommended treatment, but they are not, have not started on treatment. Um, and we would disqualify somebody with untreated symptomatic obstructive sleep apnea, uh, narcolepsy, or restless leg syndrome with excessive daytime sleepiness. Um, regarding medications, there's no list of prohibited medications. Only Schedule I drugs and methadone are prohibited. However, there's a fair amount of guidance and recommendations from the FMCSA's medical expert panels regarding medications, including opioids and psychiatric medications. The FMCSA also has posted on their website a suggested form for medical examiners to use. Um, it's called, regarding medications, it's called the MCSA 5875 or the CMV driver medication form. Um, regarding certain heart conditions, um, a current clinical diagnosis of having a heart attack, a chest pain, heart failure would be disqualifying. Once the condition is resolved um, and they have finished whatever wait period with an, after a heart attack, it's two months, um, and a cardiology gives clearance, they also need some additional testing like an echocardiogram um, and a stress test. A driver may, again, seek uh, certification. Um, regarding intracardiac defibrillators, they are disqualified drivers who have tried to apply for exemptions and have not been successful. I think that's it. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Bercelli. We have gotten quite a few questions um, that we'll be going into now. So I will be okay. reading the questions out as we receive them. Um, the first one we have is, if I have a person that has no ear and the other is working well, will this prevent them from passing a DOT physical? Um, no, remember I had said one ear, two eyes certified. So um, a driver with hearing that meets the standard, which is 40 decibels or better in, um, in one ear can be certified. Who is required to be DOT certified? Is there a specific truck size? Um, yes, there are there are criteria. It's actually um, you know on the FMCSA's website. It's 10,001 uh, pounds or more um, 
hazardous waste material, you know, if they're carrying hazardous waste, if they're carrying um, 15 or more passengers, including the driver, um, not for compensation or eight or more with it for compensation, and they're, you know, basically driving interstate and meet the other criteria, then they are required to have a medical uh, examiner certificate. What is the minimum absence days with time loss that trigger DOT records? Minimum? I'm not sure I understand that question. Okay. Like the time loss that you would have to get a new exam. There's no specific time mentioned. It's just if they've been incapacitated, um, and unable to drive, uh, you know, they need um, the motor carrier should send them in at least for a fitness for duty exam. Okay. Is Concentra responsible for reporting the updated DOT card to the DMV MBA? Uh, we report, yes, we report uh, the results on the medical examiner certificate, not not to the DMV. No, nope, that's not our job. We report it to the NRCME. Um, the NRCME actually, at some point, it's not uh, you know working at this currently, but we'll be reporting to the state driver's licensing agencies the results on a real time basis um, of of a medical exam. We have to report our results to the National Registry. Uh, within um, 24 hours of our of an exam. I have international bus, bus drivers that take their own physical exam. Can I require them to get a DOT physical here in the U.S. as well? Um, yes, you can. There is reciprocity with um, Mexico and uh, Canada. So just drivers, if they have our CDL drivers in those countries, um, don't technically require an exam, but um, you are free to send them. If you want to send them in uh, for an exam, yes, you may. Can you use another company's medical card until it expires? I'm thinking. Um, yeah, the, okay. The medical examiner certificate belongs to the driver. Okay. Um, so if the driver works for another company and takes that, you know, it's the the requirement is going to be a valid medical certificate. So, yes, it would still be, uh, you know, good. Is there a grace period for the medical card? For example, if the medical card expired January 1st and the employee gets their DOT physical on January 15th? No, there's no grace period. It expires midnight, the date um, that's written on the card. What can individuals that have been deferred due to sleep apnea do? I know you mentioned they need to get a sleep study in 90 days. Is there anything else? Um, you know, in that within that 90 days, what would help is if they do get their, um, you know, get treatment and they can come in with at least one week of compliance, you know, preferably more, preferably 30 days. Um, you know, if they have 30 days of good compliance, um, you, have, you know, depending upon the, you know, how compliant they were, the medical examiner, though, per the 2016 MRB recommend, FMCSA MRB recommendations, could issue a one-year certificate at that point. But if the driver comes in and they've waited the three months and they're, you know, just now getting their sleep study, they come in and they've got severe um, obstructive sleep apnea. The, the sleep specialist recommended CPAP and they haven't been started, you know, that's a situation where we don't want to put a driver out on the road that has untreated sleep apnea and could potentially crash. So we're going to require them to get compliance. So as much as possible, if they can get that compliance before their card expires, that, that would help them out greatly. Okay. Um, under what conditions should an employer request a fit for duty for an employee? Um, well, I think if they've, you know, there's concern about, um, you know, how they're driving, they've, um, you know, whether there's some video saying they nod it off, um, if they're, uh, somebody discloses they, they could potentially have a condition that hasn't been addressed or started a medication that may be disqualifying like methadone, um, you know, in all of those instances, 
they they should send the driver in for a fitness for duty or a new DOT exam. How do we know that a DOT physical exam is needed for an employee driver? Um, well, depending upon, you know, their, their driving, whether they need a CDL or don't need a CDL or um, because even non-CDL drivers are engaged in interstate commerce, you know, the box trucks drivers that are uh, driving around and delivering content that came from out of the state, um, you know, they're engaged in interstate commerce. So it's really going to be, um, you know, whether uh, how they declare themselves initially, uh, you know, with their driving to the to the uh, their state DOT. If a physician recommends a driver for a sleep study during the DOT physical, can the driver seek out another physician as a second opinion? Um, yeah, you know, it's up to the carrier. Certainly if it's a private pay, you know, they can go to another medical examiner. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, though, the, the FMCSA, this is an area where um, they're going to be, well, they already are auditing uh, cases where, you know, either um, an examiner was, dis I mean, a, a driver was disqualified and then, you know, the next day was, was certified. Um, things that may, you know, be red flags, they're, they're, you know, looking into those cases more and more. Um, but the driver who, from motor carrier's perspective, you don't have to accept another, um, you know, another, another exam from an, a, a, you know, a different um, medical examiner. Um, you can, you know, you, you can decide to accept it or not, but you are not required to. Is there a certain time period when an employee has not been driving that they should have a fit test done? For example, if they're away from work for over 30 days. Um, I would, you know, depending upon the condition, um, you know, if they're away for, you know, leave that, you know, taking care of a, a sick parent or a new baby or something like that, of course, probably not. But if, um, you know, you don't, the carrier often doesn't know what the medical condition was, but, you know, that left them, you know, without work, you know, they couldn't work. So I, I would say, um, you know, and it could be even, uh, there's no specific time frame. Um, it could be a driver. I've seen drivers go in for uh, stent placements and, you know, they're back uh, the next day. And that driver should at least have a, you know, week um, wait and should have a new exam upon, you know, returning from a stent placement. But we, we also have to in investigate as medical examiner whether, you know, they suffered an MI, which would require a two-month wait. Um, so there's no specific time period, but I say I'd say the longer somebody's out, probably the more serious their medical condition was, and they should have a fitness for duty or another DOT exam. Is mental health evaluated during a DOT exam? Um, as I mentioned in the neuro portion of the exam, we look for. Um, you know, their affect, are they, and are they making eye contact? Do they look, you know, disheveled or um, do they get angry? What, you know, often drivers, uh, you know, who get angry because we're limiting their certification or requiring more documentation, um, you know, they start acting out and it, you know, it, it, it concerns us greatly because um, we, you know, these are drivers that could uh, you know, have road rage and, you know, they're driving these large vehicles and certainly that's not, you know, you wouldn't want to put somebody out on the road that had, was uh, responding to a request like that. Um, we don't, if we detect something, you know, a little more serious, um, then we ask for a, we'll ask for a psychiatric evaluation. Um, also, if we, uh, I just had a, a situation this morning where I was called there was a driver that came in and he was put by his, uh, he was diagnosed with a um, bipolar disorder and put on um, some heavy duty medications by his family practitioner. And the medical examiner didn't feel comfortable certifying this driver without, you know, on these heavy duty medications that were prescribed by a non-specialist, non-psychiatrist. So he required um, a psychiatric evaluation of that, that driver. If you have employees that do not drive across state lines but drive over eight hours per day within the same state, must they have a DOT card? 
Um, it really depends. You know, they could because if they're carrying cargo uh, that, met, you know, that came from another state, um, but also you should check on your, you know, if they're requiring a CDL um, in the state or if they're school bus drivers. I mean, there are state-specific regulations that may, um, you know, maybe they don't need a federal medical examiner certificate, but many of the states follow the federal um, regulations, and so they still may need a medical exam and certificate. What are the regulations regarding a driver with narcolepsy? What documentation is needed? Really, the recommendation is that a driver with narcolepsy be disqualified. So as a medical examiner, I would make sure that that indeed was the diagnosis, um, you know, and that they, they had a formal sleep study that um, diagnosed the uh, narcolepsy. It shouldn't just be a diagnosis of kind of, ex you know, exclusion or made without a sleep study. It really needs a sleep specialist to be making that diagnosis and a sleep study have been per performed. So I would first, you know, I, I would say if it's truly narcolepsy, they're not going to be able to be certified. There's just, um, you know, it's the concern is that they could have be suddenly incapacitated, obviously fall asleep or um, some, some drivers or some individuals with narcolepsy have um, cataplexy where they just lose control of their, you know, their motor tone. So all, you know, those, kind of situations are not um, conducive to safe driving. Can there be job specific types of DOT exams? Um, yes. Uh, you can, the motor carrier can go above and beyond. So, um, for instance, they could require a driver have to lift, you know, a certain poundage, you know, 75, 80 pounds. Um, and, um, and, and so we would, you know, we would follow whatever, uh, you know, above and beyond the federal regs. You can't go less than the federal regs, but above and beyond, if they required more, um, then that's what we would consider in terms of certification. Should a drug and alcohol test be done at the time of the DOT physical? Um, if it's, uh, Yes, if it's if they're uh, you know doing it for pre pre employment, sure, yeah. Are municipalities exempt from DOT regulations? Um, most municipalities are. Um, you know, it just they they may have, as I said before, though they may have regulations that mirror the FMCSA's regulations. So it would just depend, but yeah, in general, they are um, exempt. What are your thoughts if a driver has anxiety and has to take anxiety medication? Um, the recommendation regarding the typical anxiety medications, now there are some safer um, medications used to treat anxiety um, the, uh, um, that are non-habit-forming uh, and non-sedating. The ones of concern are the class of uh, benzodiazepines or you know, sedative um, anxiolytic medications. Those are, are the concern. Uh, so the benzodiazepines, um, the FMCSA actually did a, a medical expert panel report on looking at benzodiazepines and crash risk, and there is a higher crash risk with the use of benzodiazepines. So the recommendation is not to certify a driver who is taking a benzodiazepine um, for anxiety. CBD oil in all forms is a disqualifying event, correct? Correct, because it's, um, again, as I stated, it contains, uh, even though it, you know, contains obviously minimal amounts of less than 0.3% uh, THC, um, through, unless it meets the criteria in the farm bill, it, it is illegal. It's considered a Schedule One drug, and that's illegal. Is there any, um, is there a regular schedule for how often a DOT physical is required or does that vary by driver? Um, well, uh, no uh, more than every 24 months. So that's the requirement. The physical is, is has a maximum um, 
certification date of two years. Um, but, you know, the individuals with chronic conditions um, probably re should have more frequent medical exams. So, you know, if they have hypertension, diabetes, um, probably every year, um, you know, and depending upon other conditions, um, we may, you know, want to sort of, we may, they should be examined, you know, sooner. Just depends. Are there any special requirements for part-time DOT drivers or backup drivers? No, I mean, they have to meet the criteria just like any other driver. And when we consider certification, you know, unfortunately, we can't consider the nature really of their driving. Um, for instance, um, oh, I'm only going to drive a passenger vehicle, you know, for from the airport and back or whatever it might be. I mean, we have to certify them for all the types of driving, basically. So because, as I said before, that medical examiner certificate belongs to the driver. So they could, um, you know, go from driving a box truck to driving a semi, you know, across the United States. And it's, you know, quite different demands of driving. So we have to consider kind of the worst case scenario. Does CBD oil show up in drug tests? Um, it can. It doesn't typically because of the such, you know, low content of THC. But unfortunately, you know, it's not regulated. It's not very well regulated. So the content in the CBD oil, you know, may or may not, you know, meet that, um, you know, 0.3%. Um, so if it's, uh, you know, it could be greater than that. And I think they, they've done some studies where they looked at various um, brands of CBD oil, which contained uh, various amounts of THC. So, um, but it is not, uh, MRO cannot use that, you know, the, the history of taking CBD oil as a reason for a positive uh, THC result on a regulated drug screen. So if it is positive, they're going to assume marijuana. And it would it would really take, for the most part, pretty high um, ingestion of, of CBD oil to create a positive. Okay, thank you. We have time for a couple more questions. I'm going to go through these real quick. Are there specific requirements for diabetes? Um, there, I mean, they have to be, they should be well controlled. Um, there had been a, uh, you know, some regulations in the, when there was an exemption regarding, uh, you know, keeping absorbable insulin or uh, glucose. Um, if they did have a hypoglycemic episode, there was a year wait, you know, that's basically gone away. But, you know, what they should be in good control. Um, they, and there is no hemoglobin A1C cutoff, but, you know, really we, again, look at the guidance and it should be, you know, under 11, uh, preferably more under 10. Um, uh, but, and if they do take insulin, they need that MCSA 5870 with the three months of glucose logs to be certified. Who decides if the whisper or audiometric test is taken? If the driver fails the whisper, can they elect to take an audiometric? Um, really, uh, I mean, yeah, they can elect to take an audiometric test. Uh, we'll, we will typically call the employer for authorization. If the employer doesn't authorize it, um, then we won't, you know, perform the test unless, you know, the driver would want to pay for it. But, um, yes, they can, if they fail the whisper test, they can elect to get an audiometric test. If they have hearing aids, we can't perform the test in our centers, um, we have to send them to an audiologist to perform the test. Okay, last question. If an employee has a DOT card that is not yet expired and he or she goes to be recertified but fails, can he or she continue to drive? Um, no, unfortunately, if the driver um, was disqualified at the time, of uh, the, the most recent exam, then they uh, they won't have a current certificate. It's going to be the certificate, the last certificate that will, you know, prevail. Um, if they were put on determination pending, 
they can continue to drive on the old medical examiner certificate um, until that expires or until the um, another certification decision is made. But no, unfortunately, they they would not be able to drive. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Percelli, for answering all of these questions and for giving us your time today. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That concludes our presentation on the DOT. Again, um, you should expect to receive the recording by email in the next day or two. We really appreciate your participation and all the great questions. Thank you again, Dr. Pichelli. Um, You're very informative um, and much, much appreciated. Thank you.